The science of ecology is the branch of biology that is devoted to the study of organisms in their environments. In particular, ecology examines the relationships and the interactions of living things with each other and with the environment in which they live. The Earth supports a vast diversity of environments that possess very different physical characteristics in terms of climate, moisture, temperature, and so on. Every part of an environment is interdependent on every other part. The non-living parts support living organisms and in turn, the living organisms help to renew the non-living environment. Ecologists study ecosystems. An ecosystem is defined as all the interactions of a group of organisms living in a certain area with one another and with their physical environment. There are a lot of differences in the amount of area ecosystems occupy, for they literally can be as small as this drop of pond water or as large as this tropical jungle. The variations in ecosystems are based on two different factors. First are the non-living things, known as abiotic factors, things such as water and light. Second are the biotic factors, the living community of organisms. For example, in terms of both abiotic and biotic factors, the wetlands ecosystem of this swamp is very different from the ecosystem of this rugged ocean shoreline, which in turn is quite different from the tundra ecosystem found on this snowy mountaintop. In order to better understand what an ecosystem is, let us take a look at some of the factors present in the ecosystem of a swamp. Water is a swamp's most important abiotic feature, for it plays a key role in supporting a huge biotic community consisting of aquatic organisms. Water provides them with a place in which to move about and supplies the moisture they need to stay alive. Untold trillions of organisms of tens of thousands of different types inhabit every swamp ecosystem. And each day, each member of each interdependent community plays its own special role in the great drama of life. The community of organisms in a swamp ecosystem would include tiny rod-shaped bacteria like these, one-celled animal-like and plant-like protists, microscopic multi-celled animals such as this cyclops, and much larger animals such as fish, to name just a few. Living on the water's surface are a different assortment of organisms, consisting of plants, insects, and large animals like frogs, and turtles. Of course there are also birds and mammals that are attracted to swampy environments because they are good places to hunt. And for water-loving cypress trees they are excellent places to put down roots. When studying the community of organisms in a particular ecosystem, ecologists place them into various groups based on certain characteristics in order to make them easier to understand. The most basic of these are the natural breeding groups called populations. A population is a group of the same species of organism that shares the same environment. The term species refers to organisms that are able to interbreed and produce fertile offspring. For example, in certain ecosystems, it is possible to find two distinct populations of frogs. There is a population made up of a species of small frogs like this one that dwell in trees and another population of a different species of larger frogs that prefer to dwell in ponds. Because they belong to different species, a male tree frog and a female pond frog are unable to mate and cannot produce living offspring like those seen here. The success of certain biological processes, such as mating and obtaining food, also depends on having populations of a large enough size. 
For example, certain butterflies need good-sized populations of particular flowering plants to get enough food to support an adequate breeding population. Big changes in certain populations often indicate big ecological problems. For example, when the West Nile virus kills off ravens, the populations of the rodents and insects they eat will automatically increase. And when non-native species, such as European zebra mussels, invade ecosystems, like those in the Great Lakes, various native species get crowded out and can be brought to the brink of extinction. Different populations interact with other members of their ecological community in different ways, depending on their own particular needs. For example, maple trees require a lot of light to support their life processes and produce dense canopies of leaves high above the forest floor in order to gather the sun's energy. Their leaves create a shady habitat for plants such as ferns that don't do well in a lot of sunlight. A habitat is the particular place in which an organism lives. Besides their physical habitats, organisms also occupy distinct niches within the ecosystem as well. A niche is the unique role an organism plays in its community or environment. For example, this clownfish occupies a very special niche in certain coral reef ecosystems. Clownfish are not affected by the stinging tentacles of sea anemones and live among them without fear. In other words, sea anemones provide a safe habitat for clownfish. At the same time, part of the role or niche of the clownfish in the community of coral reef organisms is to act as bait, luring other fish into the sea anemone's mouth where they can be stung and eaten. Organisms take from their environments the matter and energy they need to sustain their lives. The energy in the environment eventually gets used up, but the atoms of matter in the environment are used over and over again. The recycling of the material needed for life has been going on for billions of years and in a healthy ecosystem is maintained in a state of near perfect balance. Both matter and energy flow through ecosystems whenever organisms feed on one another, creating what ecologists call food chains. Different food chains provide different routes for the transfer of energy and materials through an ecosystem. Food producers are the first link in every food chain. Food producers are organisms such as plants or algae that can capture the raw energy of sunlight and by the process of photosynthesis convert it into the chemical energy of food. After the food producers in a food chain are the first order consumers. These are organisms that eat the food producers. A familiar example of first order consumers are leaf eating animals such as these caterpillars. Next in a food chain are the second order consumers such as caterpillar eating lizards that eat the first order consumers. Then there are the third order consumers that eat the second order consumers. For example, a bird that eats a caterpillar eating lizard would be a third order consumer. Organisms such as fungi, protists, and certain bacteria normally act as decomposers in ecosystems by breaking down dead organisms into simple nutrient materials that are used by food producers. However, decomposers are capable of feeding off of living organisms too. Food chains almost always overlap with one another. That is why ecologists use the term food webs to describe the more complicated feeding relationships they observe. Food webs are defined as all the interconnected food chains that can exist in an ecosystem. In every food chain, as the materials needed to sustain life pass from producers to consumers, usable chemical energy is gradually lost to the environment in the form of heat. Ecologists depict the flow of energy through a food chain by using a diagram like this one called the pyramid of energy. 
In such a diagram, the producers form the base. Next are the first order consumers, followed by the second order consumers, with the third order consumers at the top. One scientific study of energy flow concluded that only 16% of the energy from food producers is passed on to the first order consumers that eat them. After that, only 11% of the energy stored in the bodies of the first order consumers is passed on to the second order consumers. When third order consumers eat the second order consumers, only 5% of the available energy is passed on. To make this easier to understand, ecologists use a pyramid of numbers based on the number of organisms needed to make a simple food chain. For example, one study showed that it took 175 food producing plants to support 40 first order consumers like caterpillars. 40 first order consumers were needed to support 5 second order consumers such as the lizards that eat caterpillars. They in turn supported just one third order consumer such as a lizard eating bird. This pyramid clearly demonstrates how in a food chain large populations of certain organisms are needed to support very small populations of other organisms. Chemically speaking, all life is based on carbon. This element of matter moves through ecosystems in what is called the carbon cycle. The carbon cycle starts with air, because air contains carbon dioxide gas, a chemical compound made from one atom of carbon and two of oxygen. Land plants absorb carbon dioxide into their leaves and make sugar and other carbohydrates that can chemically store the sun's energy. Carbon dioxide also diffuses into water where it is used by aquatic food producers such as seaweed. When organisms feed, they obtain both the chemical energy stored in carbohydrates and the carbon atoms the carbohydrates contain. Some carbon atoms are used to build body tissue and others are released back into the environment as carbon dioxide when living things use chemically stored energy. Carbon is also returned to the environment when wood or fossil fuels are burned and when decomposers carry out the process of decay. The carbon cycle clearly illustrates how the materials of life, in this example, carbon atoms, are borrowed for a while by one organism and are passed on to others through food webs, or else are returned to the physical environment where they can be used again by other living things. True or false, the living things in an ecosystem make up its abiotic factors. True or false, different populations are composed of different species of organisms. True or false, a niche is the particular place in which an organism lives. True or false, food webs are made up of interconnected food chains. True or false, in food chains, many third-order consumers are needed to support only a few food producers. <laughs>